Greetings, citizens and soldiers. I am Marcus Pontius Pilatus, otherwise known to you as Pontius Pilate. Before I give you a description of my account, of my eyewitness to what occurred that fateful day, you need to know a little bit about me and my background. I, I was a Roman knight. I was a Roman knight that came from the Samanite clan, located in Ponti, which is in central Italy. I always wanted to be a part of that Roman guard. I always wanted to be active and serving in the army. So I always wanted to follow in my father's footsteps. But I lived in a pretty strict household. Very strict. Everything was done by the book. Just as my father said and directed, my mother and I should be listening. So there, I had this yearning, I had this desire, this drive to continue. To continue for power. The power that I saw that the Roman army had, that my father had, I wanted it and I wanted it more. So then, I joined the Roman army at the earliest age that I could. I joined the army. I trained for it my entire childhood. And I was, as you would say, duck to water. It's like a glove that fits the hand perfectly. That's my relationship with the Roman army. See, I raised quickly through the ranks of the army. And it was because not only have I learned from my father, but also, I was willing to do anything, at any cost, to ensure whatever order, whatever command was given to me, it would be followed through. Because Rome must flourish at any cost, even if a little force had to be used from time to time. Even if a little dirty play had to happen, I was not afraid. So Janice, a fellow military man, he took note. He liked how inflexible I was, how determined I was, how obedient I was, and how much I held Rome in regard. It helped. It helped that he, he was a prefect. He was a prefect to the Praetorian Guard there in Rome, to the emperor himself. In fact, Sejanus was also the chief administrator for the Roman Empire under our emperor Tiberius. It helped that my fellow military men looked at me and saw that I could be used for a higher purpose, a higher calling, if you will. So he recommended me. He recommended me to be the prefect. Prefect of Samaria, Judea, and that great little jewel of a city, Jerusalem. With Sir Janus's backing, the Senate's approval, I became that prefect, but not only to a two or three year term that was common then, my term of prefect for that area was for 10 years. That was the deal. Maybe it was because Sejanus wanted me to do his dirty work in that area. Maybe it was because Sejanus wanted me to go out and do what he 
had to do, or could it do. He wanted me. He wanted me to go about to that area, to enforce the rules, to make sure that this area was secure. But maybe I got 10 years also because of who I was married to. I knew that not only brawn, but brains would ensure my rise to the ranks. So I made sure to marry up. I married Claudia Abrocula, beautiful woman, powerful woman, one that came from a powerful lineage of, yes, even Caesar Augustus himself. So with Sejanus and with Claudia, I was in the perfect position. I was the prefect of Samaria, of Judea, and of Jerusalem. But then that fateful Friday occurred. I remember it well. I was already a part of the way through my morning routine. My work day consisted from 6 a.m. until noon, six hours of Roman work. I was two hours in, reviewing cases, handing down judgments, reviewing military tactics, and going over taxation orders. And then, those, those religious leaders came in. Oh, I despise them. They hated me. The feeling was mutual. But I had to keep the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. So even though I despised them, I had to listen and hear them out. They brought in a man, a prisoner. His name, Jesus. I looked at the prisoner they brought in. Beaten a little bit, but I noticed something right away. His eyes. I looked into his eyes and I did not see any fear. Instead of condemnation, instead of worry and anxiety, there was passion and determination. I asked why they had brought this man before me, although I already knew. They wanted me to do what they could not do. They wanted me to sentence this man, this Jesus, to death. So I went to my chair, and I heard. I heard their arguing. I heard their accusations. And I looked at Jesus. Is this true? Say something! His response was eloquent and to the point. This, this man was far beyond his years. You can see it in his eyes. You can see it in his face. Every time I try to trap him in my web of words, he was able to get untangled. My legal antics, they were useless. And as I looked at him, as he looked at me, it was looking into my eyes like he already knew my thoughts. He already knew my words that were going to come out of my mouth before I could speak them. He knew me. He knew me. My inner self. I could not find any charge that would stick. In fact, if anything, the ones that brought him should have been tried. 
So I announce my verdict. This man is innocent. He should be set free. Then, those religious leaders, those temple guards, those Sanhedrin, those Pharisees, all those zealots, they got angry. How can you let this Jesus of Nazareth do this? He cannot be, whoa, whoa, whoa. What did you say? Where is he from? Jesus of Nazareth. A Galilean? You have brought me a Galilean? Off of him. But wait. Perfect opportunity for a power play. He is under Herod's jurisdiction. Herod. Oh, yeah. He's been meaning to see you. He wants to see if you're all cracked up to what you are, who you say, and what has been told. Not my problem. Take him to Herod. Now. Peace offering to Herod. Gotta keep the peace. Gotta build the relationships. Got to make sure the empire stays intact. Upon going down the street to Herod, though, Herod did not find any guilt in him, any charge or mistake. So he sent them back to me, to my courtyard. Later that morning, it was late in the morning, I was wanting to be done with my work day. But the crowd kept getting bigger and filling in the streets outside of my home. Why is he back? Herod could find no charge in him, they said. And he said, you deal with him. Oh, I'll deal with him. Let's go through this again. What charge have we brought against him? He's been inciting the people. He's been a rebel rouser. He's done this. He's done that. None of those accusations from those religious zealots could stick. So I shook my head. I said, enough. Again. This man has committed no crime. He is innocent. I find him not guilty. The crowd erupted in anger. As the crowd got larger and larger because of the Passover feast, they wanted blood. His blood. They wanted. They wanted Jesus. As the crowd noise began to rumble louder, spilling over the streets and the surrounding blocks, my wife's personal servant comes up to me and hands me a note. I open it and I read it. Have nothing to do with this man. My wife, she's been inside all day. She wasn't here for the proceedings. How does she know anything about this guy? So now I have my wife who doesn't want me to have anything to do with him. I have the religious zealots who want me to just do whatever kind of punishment that they want on him. How can I appease both and show that I have ultimate power? Ah. It's a feast. And the custom at the feast is to release a prisoner. I've got the plan to show that I have the power to appease my wife and also to get these religious zealot leaders out of my house. I'll give you a choice. Who do you want released unto you this day? This man, Jesus, or had to choose the most vile criminal I had in the dungeon. Bar Arras, son 
of fathers. He was no son of a father. He was more like a pain in my rear. He was a murderer. Caused insurrection. Perfect person. Bring us. Bring us far rats. Who do you want released? Jesus or Bar Aramis? Didn't expect that the religious leaders had quickly paid off the crowd as they did. As they said, release Barabbas, release Barabbas. That move failed this way. I had to stick with the tradition as I released Bar Barabbas. I'll see you again soon. But then what should I do with this man, Jesus? What should I do with him? What do you want done? Crowds yelled, Crucify him! Crucify him! Louder and louder they chanted. But why? He has done no wrong. Crucify! They want what? Give the people what they want. Fine. I'll have them scourged. I'll have a scourge and then you can have it. The scourge, the nickname for it was called half death. Because it took a man to the point and brink of death itself. And it was a punishment that left scars for a lifetime. So my soldiers bound this Jesus to a pole there in the courtyard. They gathered around him. The taskmaster came out with that rod, those leather straps tied to the end, each holding a piece of rock, metal, or bone. And they scourged him. The whip hit his back, tearing the flesh off of it, off of his sides, off of his legs. His wounds opened up, blood dripping down on the dust. In a matter of minutes, it was over. But throughout it all, he didn't say a word. In fact, looking into his eyes, there was the look of determination. More determination, more inner strength than what I even saw before. He was about to pass out. My men gave him immediate medical care. They tended to his wounds, reviving him to life as that blood pooled around him. He was to that point and brink of death. But the leaders, the crown, they were not satisfied with that. Crucify him! Crucify him! What more do you want? What wrong has he done? I have punished him accordingly more than what he deserved. You want him? You got him! He's yours! washed my hands in a basin, flinging the water, drying it off. This man's blood is not on these hands. It's on you. Go. Do as you see fit. So they took him. And they started the process of crucifixion. But one last parting gift I gave to those religious zealots. Let the charge be hung on his cross. Here is the King of the Jews. <laughs> they despised that. Change it, they said. Not the King, our King, a false King. No! I have spoken, 
It is written. It is done. This is your king. He is the king of the Jews. That was it. That was the beginning of the end of my reign. A few years later, a few years later, I was brought up on charges that I might have killed some innocent Samaritans. The new emperor Caligula, he frowned at me. So I was brought to Rome to face those charges. But as I, as I stood in trial, as I stood there on the other side, I couldn't help but think back to a few years earlier to the trial of Jesus. That sacrifice, that innocent sacrifice, shed his blood for them all. How I washed my hands clean of it. But they weren't. They weren't clean at all. I was dirty. I was going to go down. But all that I could remember was the look of Jesus as I washed my hands. And it wasn't a look of condemnation. It was a look of love. As he nodded with what little strength he had in those weak knees, those bloody shoulders, he nodded as to say, it's going to be okay. Hail, King of the Jews.